You know, I know Sue Ann. She was the administrator in student ministries when I was youth pastor, and she is still today. And if anybody you know her, many of you do, there is not a sweeter, kinder, more godly woman, and we're grateful for her. And I was with her in the moment when that happened with her husband, Rich, when she lost him. And she talked about how God was with her, which is really at the heart of this series. I want to say again, welcome to all of you, and particularly those of you who are at our Mill Creek campus watching this. We're glad you're with us this morning. We begin a new series for Advent. It will lead us for four weeks right up to Christmas Eve. The series is simply titled With. It's focused on what it means to know the truth in the name of God, Emmanuel, God with us. What does that really mean? Is that just something we say at Christmas time to make ourselves feel better? Or is there real power and truth in it for us? In this season, culturally, it's been, I think it starts shortly before Halloween now with Starbucks cups. But it's, uh, on a cultural side, this is the season of shopping. How many of you are Black Friday people? You love it, you go out, and you're crazy, yeah? How many of you just get annoyed with all the rest of those who go out shopping on Black Friday? I'm driving home from my folks' house Thursday night going, what are all these people doing out at 11 o'clock at night? Oh, yes. Looking for the deal. It's the season of shopping, ordering, baking, wrapping. For kids, it's the season of waiting for that morning, right? For, the, for Christmas. Historically for Christians, Advent has been a season of preparation and anticipation. For the arrival, that's what the word means, Advent. Arrival. The arrival of God himself come to earth. The celebration of Christ. But for many of us, if we're totally honest, I think this is a season full of activity without much time for rest or reflection. Sometimes, and I've experienced this, you're just glad when it's over. There's so much to do. It's so exhausting. So much family stress. You just get to... I remember when my kids were young, we would go Christmas Eve here at the, at the service, then drive to my wife's parents' place in Wheaton, have Christmas Eve with her family, have dinner, open presents, drive home at midnight, go to midnight service, drive home at her church, family's church, drive home, get home, go to bed. My kids would get us up at three, whatever, in the morning, open presents, and then drive to my parents' house in Crystal Lake with my side of the family. By the 26th, I was exhausted. It looked like a toy bomb went off in our house. Just wanted to be over. Holiday stress and anxiety are very real. In fact, 78% of Americans say they do feel happier during the season, but not as happy as they think they should. Which is, a, I mean, how do you answer that? Yes, I'm happy, but not as happy as I feel like I should be. It's a difficult season for many of us. And a joyous one, too. So as I said, the series of our, our theme for the series is with. Now, we could talk about being with, our, with friends and family. We've talked about that. Chris Saris mentioned that when she talked about being together. We could talk about being with each other in worship for this season. But the heart of this season and of this series is found in the name Emmanuel, God with us. And we're going to spend the next four weeks unpacking what that means. You might think four weeks on one word, one name, that's actually... A small bit of time for all that's in that name. That's bound up in the name Emmanuel. Because to say Emmanuel is to say God's with us. And if you were here in the beginning of our last series in Hebrews, we talked at the very outset that the God who made all that exists, who's greater than the universe, greater than the angels, greater than the prophets, who holds all things together by a word of his power, that God is not far off and distant. He's with us. He's present in a personal way. Today we begin with the promise of Emmanuel. A couple of years ago I read a book by Ethelbert Stauffer. Terrible name, but good book. Called Christ and the Caesars. Looking at the message of Jesus, the gospel message, in the time of Jesus during the Roman Empire and the reign of the Caesars. And he, write, he writes this in the introduction. One of the oldest longings of human history is the longing for God to appear on earth. And he spends a couple of chapters unpacking what this means. I think this is really important and insightful. One of the oldest longings of human history, of our hearts, of our existence, is the longing for God to appear on earth. And this is the reason we see throughout history in different regions, in different eras, in different races and cultures, these different myths of God becoming human. The Persians have these myths, the Greeks have these myths, the Romans have these myths, Norse mythology of God's walking the earth. If you remember your mythology, you grew up learning about this stuff, right? God's appearing and walking the earth, and they're all different. And you might think, well, that sort of disproves the Christian story. All religions and races and cultures have these myths. This is just one more myth. But you might also see it as, why is it that almost every culture in human history had some story about God's appearing 
if there wasn't a truth behind that, if there wasn't a longing behind that. At times in the ancient world, this sort of thing popped up. In fact, in Acts chapter 14, uh, Peter, or, or Paul and Barnabas show up in the ancient city of Lystra and they're performing miracles by the power of God. And the people of Lystra, some of you know the story. If not, you can look it up in Acts 14. They think, oh, it's Zeus and Hermes. Come down. And Paul has to say, no, we're not gods. But how, they were so quick to believe they were. We modern people wouldn't be so credulous. But at times in the ancient world, this longing was politicized to the point where the king or ruler was viewed as divine, as God on earth. Ancient Egypt, I'll just to give you a couple examples. Pharaoh Tutmos III, his, his image. It was said of him, God of heaven is my father and I am his son. Or the king, king Xerxes of Persia. The days of salvation have now begun at his advent. Sound familiar, this language? Or Rome, Caesar Augustus. Welcome him who is the longed for one, the savior of all mankind. These are phrases used of ancient kings. The combination of this longing for God to appear and longing for a perfect ruler, I think, sets the stage for what we read about when we come to the Christmas story. Every advent of every ruler or every king has in it, deep, deep down inside, sometimes overt and stated like we just read, sometimes hidden, this longing for a perfect ruler, this longing for God to make things right, for someone someday to show up and, and do away with all the injustice. Don't we have the same longing today? Don't you see it in election cycles in our culture? Well, maybe this most recent one, not so much. But did, haven't you seen that every election year? The promise is made. Now we figured it out. This person, we place our hope in this person and these policies and all will be well. It's the same deep longing we all have for someone someday to show up and fix it. It is a human longing as old as we are. With that as a backdrop, let's read the familiar words of Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Notice, it's a familiar passage, but in the context of this sort of human longing for someone to come and make things right, for God to appear on earth, maybe it makes more sense to you or you, you hear it differently. The promise begins with this dream, right, of Joseph. He's betrothed. Now, betrothed is a little different than our, our understanding of engagement. In our culture, we talk about being engaged, and people can break engagements, and then that happens not that frequently, but it does happen. But to be betrothed was a year-long process in first century Jewish culture, and it was legally binding. You could not break that betrothal. It was viewed almost as binding as the marriage. You were viewed as married until consummated, unless there was a breaking of the marriage commitment. There were some legal reasons that you could break it. Otherwise, you can't just decide, oh, I changed my mind. I don't want to be betrothed anymore like we do today. Joseph is betrothed to Mary, and he finds out she's not pregnant. She is pregnant, and it's not his. He doesn't need an angel to tell him that. He's not been with her. And because he's a just man, he's thinking about, what should I do here? Then it begins with this dream. The angel speaks to him. The first thing I want you to see is the promise of a son. The very first thing the angel says to Joseph is, do not fear. Which, by the way, whenever angels show up, they're always saying, because they're not cute babies with wings and, and harps or bow and arrow like Cupid. They're, they're creatures that reflect the glory of God. And for us on earth, it's terrifying. It's overwhelming. It's coming close to his holiness. The Jewish law of the day actually required Joseph, the betrothed, to put away Mary. 
And he really had two choices. He really, he, 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 he could not continue, legally speaking, with this marriage. It would be very, it would be way outside the cultural norm for him to decide to go through with the, with the marriage. He could either publicly shame her and announce, like in the village, what she'd done. That she was pregnant and it wasn't his. Like sort of wash his hands up and say, I'm not involved, it's not mine. She did this, not me. Or he could do it quietly. Not wanting to shame her. And you have to think of it this way. He's thinking deeply about what should I do. I think it's helpful to get inside the story a little bit. He finds out his wife-to-be is pregnant. And it's not his baby. And she's got some story about an angel told her something. What do I do? What do I do? Can you imagine on the angst, how worked up he is, how stressed he is, how fearful he is? What should I do? And because he's a good man at heart, he decides, I don't, I can't marry her, but I still love her. and I can't shame her. So I'll just do this quietly. I imagine this happening at night, right? Laying on his bed, troubled sleep, keeps thinking about what to do, what the, the loss of a dream to be married to this girl, whole life changed, falls off into a fitful sleep, and an angel speaks to him. Let's read verse 20 again. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. One of the things I love about this story is the perfect timing of God. The moment when he needed it most, God speaks to him, speaks to his heart. He, he's wrestling over what to do, right? This is a moment of truth for him. It's a crossroads in his life. What do I do here? I love her, but look what's happened. This isn't my child. What is she? I don't know if I can trust her. In that moment of despair and fear, God speaks to him and says, don't be afraid. I wonder if you had God speak to you in the moment you needed it most. Maybe it was a dream. Maybe it was somebody else giving you a word that you needed, an encouragement. Maybe it was his word. It was a song, just a still small voice in your own heart. God's timing is perfect here when Joseph needs to hear it. Now, Luke's account of this whole story tells us that Mary had already had an angel, Gabriel, visit her and give her the big announcement. And, and, and tell her that she's going, she's going to conceive a child by the Holy Spirit. And she's a young teenage girl. Imagine, imagine the questions she would have. What's that going to be like, right? But she says, may it be to me as you have said. And she, she clearly must have told Joseph about this. And he presumably doesn't believe her yet. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and then she becomes pregnant. I, I'm projecting here, but I imagine as a human man, he's thinking, was this all just a setup to cover your sin that you've been with some other guy and you're giving me this story about an angel? Until he has the vision and the dream and the angel says the exact same thing to him. Then he realizes something, there's something about this child. The promise of this son is different. And then there's this little line. He says, you're going to have a son. You're going to call him his name, Yeshua, Jesus. And this little line about his purpose and the reason and why he exists. And this brings us to the promise of a savior. For Joseph to hear that this child was to be his adopted son and that this child was to be the long-awaited for Messiah, this would have been amazing news when he began to believe it. I wonder if every Jewish girl growing up since the prophets wondered if my child will be the Messiah. The Messiah is going to come eventually. Someday, God's long-awaited for promise deliverer of Israel is going to show up. It's going to be one of us. Now, how many of you moms don't have big dreams for your child? Don't have big dreams and visions for what your son or daughter could become? We just dedicated children up here. Can you imagine being a first century Jewish mom? Probably not some of you guys, right? Wondering, is it my child? And then Joseph hears the news. Yes, actually, yes. Your adopted son, the son growing in Mary's womb, is the one. Is the one, the promise of a savior. But this curious explanation of what he's going to do. Let me read verse 21. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. 
the Jewish expectation of salvation. We hear that and it's sort of like just so familiar to us, right? It's Christmas time, you read that verse, oh yeah, that's nice. We sort of hear that and we think peace on earth, goodwill toward men, which is actually something the Bible doesn't say. Peace on earth, goodwill toward those on whom his favor rests, it says. Like sort of this, sort of this in vague way, I don't really know let me give you a crude example. You know how at Easter time there's eggs and bunnies, but what do they have to do with Jesus? We just accept them? I don't know, but we, we like them, right? I think sometimes for, for many people in our culture, the baby in the manger is, is like an Easter egg. I don't really know what it has to do with, with salvation and peace, but, you know, it's a nice story. In some vague, undefined way, the child in the manger means everybody's okay and God just loves everyone and it's all good. We all live in peace forever. That's not actually the message of Christmas. The message of Christmas has a much harder edge to it. He said, the angel says to Joseph, he will save his people from their sins. The Jewish expectation of salvation in the first century was not this. It was someone's going to come someday and kick out the oppressors, Rome. Remember the picture of Caesar Augustus? It's going to overthrow the Caesars. Going to reestablish David's throne, David, the great king of Israel. Politically, economically, socially, militarily, we're going to be a power again like we've never been before, and some great king, born a Jew, is going to do that. But the text doesn't tell us that the angel said, Joseph, your son will grow to be a great military leader, a great king to overthrow Caesar. It says your son will save his people from their sins. This would have been confusing for Joseph. He will save his people from their sins. That's the real message of Christmas. You know, there's a story in Luke chapter 5, and some of you might know it or know of it. It's this, these four friends bring a man who's paralyzed on a mat to Jesus. Do you remember this story? And they lower him down through a hole in the roof, which they ripped the roof apart, you know, not very considerate. And they lower him down on the mat. He's paralyzed right at Jesus' feet while he's teaching a jam-packed crowd ab about the kingdom of God. He stops and he looks at the man and he says these words, your sins are forgiven. I imagine being that guy going, well, gee, thanks, but I can't walk, right? The, the, what the text says that in, that in Luke 5, the Pharisees who are watching this say to themselves, I mean, they mutter in their minds and hearts, who does this guy think he is forgiving sins? Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus knows their thoughts. And he says, so that you will know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. I tell you, get up and walk. That is a, that's a profound story. He's saying the big issue with you is not that you can't walk. It's that you have a sinful heart. The big issue with you is not your 401k. It's not your career or lack of one. It's not your relational dysfunction in your family. It's not your pain of loss of someone like Sue Ann talked about. These are all real pains and real issues, but they're not your big problem. Your biggest issue is that you're not right with God because of sin. And the message of Christmas is a son is going to be born. His name's going to be Yeshua, which means God saves because he's going to do just that. He's going to forgive sin. He's going to solve the big problem if you'll trust him. All other issues are ancillary to that, is what we're told. This would have been mind-blowing stuff to Joseph. We hear it and kind of slide right by it, because it's Advent season. The heart of the gospel is not political, it's not economic, it's not social. There are, of course, no doubt, political implications to the gospel. There are economic implications to the gospel. There are justice and social implications to the gospel. But the heart of the gospel is you have a sinful heart, and because of it, you're far from God. And God, who is perfect and loving, loves you so much that he would come into this world for you as one of us. The manger makes no sense without the cross. It makes no sense without the cross. Now, this is not very popular today. It doesn't tweet well. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't get a lot of likes or follows or retweets if you just type in all capital letters, SIN, <laughs> on your Twitter account. But that's the real message of Christmas. For all the fun stuff and the nostalgic, and I love all of it, I love all of it about the season. But the real message is, he will save his people from their sin. That's why he came. Not to make us feel nostalgic once a year, but to fix what's wrong with our hearts, which is ultimately what's wrong with the world. Last, 
the promise of Emmanuel. In verse 22, uh, Matthew gives a little commentary on the bigger picture for, uh, for, of the angel's message here. Let me read to you verses 22 through 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall, con shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, all this took place, he says. Matthew now, the, the angel's done. In verse 21, he, he says, it's conce what's in her womb is of the Holy Spirit. Period. End of quotation. Then Matthew says, all this, all what? All of Joseph's dream and what the angel said took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. What prophet? The prophet Isaiah, 730 plus years ago, during the reign of the, of the Jewish king Ahaz, says this, these words in chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin shall conceive and bear a child, a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. 730 years before the angel shows up to speak to Joseph, Isaiah says this is going to happen, the promise of Emmanuel. The actual name Emmanuel shows up only three times in all the Bible, twice in Isaiah and once here in Matthew chapter 1. But the concept of God with us is on every page practically. It's the, you could make it the case that the idea of God with us is the whole story. In the garden, he creates us in his image to be in relationship with him. God with us. And in Genesis 3, we lose that presence. We lose the withness, in a sense, because that's the, whole, that's the whole imagery of cast out of the garden, east of Eden, the flaming sword. You can't go back, right? We now, because of our sin, which Jesus came to deal with, are cut off from his presence. He's not with us in the same way that he was. The loss of his presence. And then in Genesis 11, there's a story about the Tower of Babel, this weird tower these ancient people build called a ziggurat. What are they doing? They're trying to bring down the presence of God to call down by their own strength and ingenuity to get back that which was lost. And you could make the argument that everything we're doing in the modern world through economics and everything else is an attempt to somehow regain what was lost. Because where the presence of God is is peace and joy and love and righteousness and goodness. It's what we long for. Moses in Exodus 33 says, I'm not going unless you go with us. Jacob has a dream at Bethel, which means Bethel, means the house of God. Surely God was in this place and I wasn't even aware of it. He was with me and I didn't even see it. Jacob wrestles with the angel, which turns out to be God. And he says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. Meaning what? I, I don't, don't leave me. J David prays, take not your presence from me. Cast me not away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. The whole story of the Bible is a story of God being with us and that presence lost and our effort to regain it and we can't in our own strength. And then comes these words to Joseph. You're going to have a son. His name's going to be Jesus. He is the one. God with us. The prophet Ezekiel echoes this in chapter 37, verse 27. My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. All throughout the Old Testament, this longing for God to be with us is a, not really a present reality, but a future hope. And then we find out it's the present reality in Jesus. Let me ask this question as we get close to wrapping up here. You know like a pastor say we get close to wrapping up? You don't really know how long that is. Right? Close is a relative term. What's the greatest gift God could give you? When you were a kid, you remember the time when you, like now for my kids, it's gift cards and cash. I, it's Christmas has lost some of the magic, I have to admit. I still love getting together, but the, the, the joy of opening the presents and the big surprise is sort of over. That season has passed for us. What's the, what's the greatest gift God could give you? If you could ask him for one thing, what would it be? Grace, mercy, forgiveness, purpose, peace, reconciliation, right? We could make a long list of the things. Those aren't the greatest gift. The greatest gift God can give you is the gift of himself. Everything else that God could give you, all those things I just listed, grace and joy and mercy and forgiveness, only come through him. It's not like there's no thing that God like, separates from himself and says, here's forgiveness. Like, I'm not involved, but here you go. All wrapped up for you. You only get those things when you get him. Sinclair Ferguson says it this way. 
There's no thing that Jesus takes from himself and then gives, as it were, hands it over to us. There was only Jesus himself. So when you ask God for forgiveness, when you ask God for, for peace, when you ask him for comfort, when you ask him for provision, you're asking him for more of himself. And he's already given you. That's the great news of Christmas. He has given you fully, given us fully himself. God with us. This is why C.S. Lewis says that the name Emmanuel is weightier than all the universe. What's contained in those three words, God with us, is weightier than all the universe. What you need more than anything else in your life is the presence of God. Do you believe that? What you need more than anything else in your life is the presence of God. And you have it in Christ. In your pain, like Sue Ann talked about, in your prosperity, in your joy, in your victory, in your disappointment. Matthew's gospel begins with this promise of God with us in chapter 1, verse 23. You know how it ends? Chapter 28, Jesus on the mountainside, before he ascends, you remember what he says? And I will be with you, even to the very end of the age. Begins and ends with this promise. In fact, the whole Bible ends with this promise. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. That's the whole story, friends. Because of our sin, we have lost the presence of God. But our God is not willing to let it stand. He came to be with us. He wants to be with you. You know, the great hymn writer and theologian and pastor Jonathan Wesley, his children wrote, some of, they compiled some of his memoirs. And they tell the story of his deathbed. Some of you might know this story. That on his deathbed, he's surrounded by his family. And among his last words, he raised his hand from his bed and said in a voice just above a whisper, the best of all is Emmanuel. Think about that. The last words of a man given his life to serving God. The best thing of all is God with us. This season, we talk about together at Christmas and being together in worship and doing all these things. And that's important. Focus on what matters. But above family time, above lights and meals and shopping and wrapping and gathering, above singing, above the familiarity, above all of it, what matters most is the singular promise that God wants to be with you. If I have any prayer for my heart, for my families, and for yours this, the next four weeks this season, is that you come to know in a way you have never known before the presence of God in your life. God with you through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this incredible truth, this ancient promise, long ago foretold, that a young girl would be with child and give birth to a son and his name would be Jesus because he would save us from our sin. And through him, we would know that you're with us. We thank you, Jesus, our Emmanuel. We praise you in your name. Amen.